Thank you so much, Saif. That's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for organizing this wonderful event. Uh, we have quite a vast topic to discuss today uh, with this wonderful panelist. So we will be talking about the current state of the blockchain space and digital assets. We can talk about this for all day long, but I guess let's, let's try to focus on what excites you the most in the space currently. So my first question to you would be, um, the time frame that was given to us by the organizers 12 months. So what has been exciting you in the space during the last 12 months that you would like to highlight to us today? Let's maybe start with Jane. Ladies okay. first. Okay, thanks. Well, I think the thing that excited me the most in the last 12 months has been the incredible experimentation cry, and the greater engagement that people have had with blockchain, and particularly in emerging never... economies, because this is where people were suffering so much and they couldn't afford or receive the expensive remittance flows. They couldn't get foreign exchange because they were shut down. So small micro entrepreneurs in villages started using uh, Bitcoin and remittance transfers in crypto to buy their Netflix and Spotify cards. People started trading, people started playing games. And, and we can see with chain analysis and uh, we are social 2021 that the top 20 countries where adult population owned cryptos are nearly all in emerging economies. So I think the thing that excites me the most are uh, also, not to mention the play to earn games, because here we've got people in the Philippines feeding their families by playing Axie Infinity and other games. So we're seeing the power of blockchain and crypto actually helping the people who need it. So that's what's excited me the most. Awesome. Thank you very much, Jane. Dr. Mawan, like Dubai excites us the most. And what is happening in Dubai right now, uh, all these wonderful people gathering for blockchain related discussions, but what excites the heart of the Dubai blockchain developments? I think uh, when you have a lot of people coming from all walks of life, from everywhere in the world, you have this huge melting pot of ideas, opportunities, collision spaces, and uh, we know we, we were missing all the stuff when we had the COVID situation. And you know, the, the Zoom meeting or the Teams meeting or all these Virtual meetings were okay and we got used to them, but I think we learned. <laughs> I think right now it's time to get back to actual physical conferences, actual physical meetings, meeting and greeting each other, you know, seeing each other, seeing the body language again. You know, it's very important, not only for the crypto industry, but for every kind of industry. This meeting creates huge opportunity. Collision spaces are an important part of how we evolved as humans. So people interactions and uh, opportunities that arrive out of this, these interactions. Henry, you've been interacting a lot with different businesses. Uh, what excites you in the blockchain space and uh, what excites those to whom you propose the solutions? Absolutely. First of all, very, very excited to be back to in-person events and great, great to be here with you all. I think what, obviously a lot of the exciting retail developments have been really uh, uh, being keeping at, at the attention, but really what's really exciting me right now, and I know it's very uh, contradictory in the crypto ecosystem, but is the entry of institutional players. I think whether we like it or not, the entry of institutional players with the buy side, sell side, from the hedge funds coming in, really brings a level of experience, expertise to the industry, not that the crypto industry needs and deserves as well. And I think that's a really, really big game changer when it comes to financial institutions coming in, the crypto players getting a lot of the, even the boring stuff that we get, you know, the SOC 1, SOC 2, ISO certification, big for audits, but this really brings the ecosystem to a different level from that perspective. And I think that's super exciting. Another report as well is the regulatory clarity. Whether we like it or not, this industry, we need some level playing field, and that comes with regulatory uh, clarity. I'm happy today, according to Cambridge University, only 5% of regulators do not have somebody working on crypto. I think for many years, we were the only ecosystem lobbying formal regulations to have a level playing field, and I'm very happy to see that in many countries, including here, actually we have this kind of base, and this is what allows the industry to grow, institutional capital to come in, and really accomplish the vision of crypto that I think many of us have when it comes to the future of finance and the future of money. Thank you, Henry. That was inspiring. Sandeep. Well, Ethereum network has definitely been something fascinating during the last 12 months. What insights do you have? What excites you the most? 
so um, for me like uh, i mean building the infrastructure uh, for the uh, you know uh, blockchain community the most exciting thing is that compared to 2017 uh now we have product market fits so basically we have defi as the product market fit we have nfts as the product market fit we have daos as the product market fit so for me the most exciting thing is that you know even maybe one and a half years back you know everybody used to debate that whether these things are really going to fly whether defi is really going to fly with the retail or uh, in the in the real world or it is going to be some crypto niche right so uh, so 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 that's the most exciting part for me and especially uh, you know with this uh, with with the current nft boom um, i think what nfts i mean i generally like to call nfts as the you know trojan horses of crypto industry into the real world and it is bringing masses into it like the 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 the, the interactions and the and the and the brands and institutions that we are onboarding at the pace that we are onboarding them today it's like absolutely phenomenal and it's going to like you know what we used to say that in next you know maybe 3 to 5 years it's going to affect each and every or not affect i mean i mean i mean to say that it's going to touch you know probably a billion uh, humans on this planet in some form or the other where are we where are we right now in your opinion on the level of exploring the nft potent potential on the percentage level so i mean it's it's still very very early days i mean if you ask me and you know i've been uh, you know into the nft space when like in 2018 uh, i mean axi infinity team and you know gabby from ygg we used to roam around in these gaming conferences and they used to give us like a small room <laughs> somewhere <laughs> to to discuss and uh, you know today axi infinity is you know clocking like billions of dollars in revenue and things like that so Uh, uh, but but i feel that you know what what we are seeing today is uh, the the uh, what i eventually see is that you know all the brands like you you know, recently i don't know how many people saw the dolce and gabbana launching their uh, you know uh, the 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 current uh, you know season launch and i feel that you know in 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 maybe you know 12 months 18 months 24 months you will see a time where no brand will launch their collection without an nft collection for a spring summer or a winter collection no bollywood movie or hollywood movie will launch without an nft launch it is it is like i can clearly see like bollywood you you guys will very soon see there's still a lot of exciting things to be announced but you know i feel that bollywood in 12 to 16 months you will see all the movies in some form or the other interacting with nfts same is going to happen with hollywood celebrities you already can see so i think we are still getting started because this institutional space as uh, you know uh, we were saying that that's the real uh, you know flood gates uh, for this industry and that's just getting started awesome yeah i agree with you totally agree with you yeah here yeah. what about you what excites you the most sure uh, hi everyone Uh, really good to be out and about and see people in real life again agree with my fellow panelists about the post post pandemic trends of uh, digital being dominant i think we'll start seeing and i i personally uh, i'm a bit conflicted about this i think we'll start seeing people living in a digital world a little bit more than they do in the physical world Uh, I'm a little old school so that that I'm not sure how I feel about that but it's it's definitely a trend that we're noticing more specifically on on regulations as Henry was saying uh, we're starting to see further regulatory clarity and definitely the UAE is a, is a pioneer on that front in terms of when the regulations came out and and how clear they are it was also apparent to all of us during the uh, the time during when we were quarantined that work can be done in many different ways so the idea of work of the organization uh, will change and people will start i believe will become more independent uh, and the idea of having a, a fixed job with a fixed time in a fixed place that's all going to change it was happening before but i think it it, it needed a, an extreme event similar to the one we all experienced to to happen so really excited about what comes out from that but i would still prefer to to be in person and uh, and meet uh, as opposed to doing the digital stuff awesome thank you so much yeah i also agree that for me honestly the most exciting part of the industry is the community 
And it's such a pleasure to see you all here in person because, well, this is what makes the industry growing. That, that this is what, what pushes forward this visionary ideas uh, that has always been a um, visit card of the industry. Well, I've, I started in 2017 and uh, there was this startup vibe, this passion uh, everywhere. And it's still there. But plus we had, um, we now have expertise, we have more knowledge, we definitely have acquired this level of professionalism that uh, maybe in the beginning we lacked a bit just because we were so young inside and uh, ambitious and daring. Uh, so the community is definitely something that, um, that makes this industry so special. So my next question to you is, um, you are all a very cosmopolitan per people. How would you um, evaluate the particularity of the community, blockchain community, uh, in your respective countries of uh, living business. I would like to start with Dr. Mawan. Uh, we are in Dubai, so what makes Dubai so special? How uh, do you handle here different interactions uh, for blockchain developments between um, academia, governmental authorities, police? I know that you have a special uh, special department in the police that uh, handles uh, crypto-related um, crimes. Uh, businesses, innovators, so tell us a little bit more about the local community, please. So uh, I think Dubai is, is very lucky for, for being actually physically in the middle of the world as well. Very easy logistics, uh, very good mobility, uh, very good road network, telecommunications network. And this is very important. A lot of people do not understand that these are the prerequisites to create a happy society. You know, these friction points that could exist, whether it is a very small thing like uh, things like mobility solutions or, or a bad connection in your mobile phone. You might think, it, we take it for granted actually in Dubai. And only when you go outside of Dubai, if you get a pothole somewhere on a road some, in some country, You'll be like, ah, oh, this is so annoying, you know? But in Dubai, we take all this stuff for granted because we are, you know, uh, used to this kind of comfortable, you know, living, used to be used to this comfortable, even when you apply, comfortable, comfortable user experience when you apply for a job, when you apply for a license, when you apply for a bank account, when you apply for all the stuff, everything is smooth and, and it's easy to, get, to take for granted. But if you just look here, even in the audience, a lot of people see this for the first time. They have one or two pain points that we take for granted. For them, is actually really annoying. But them being here in Dubai and experiencing this, you cannot go back now to you know, these little annoyances. You will go back to your country. You will see, say that, uh, look at Dubai, what they're doing. You improve your community. You improve your workplace. You improve your user experience. As a business and also as a regulator, as a government, we are the model that people follow right now. Right now. And we are the place that people come for, for these kind of conveniences. And I think this is a very important message that a lot of people who come to Dubai and leave do not portray to their colleagues. And I think you should talk about this. You should talk about your Dubai experience. You should talk about the things that we've done right. Nobody's perfect. And I was just telling Salim, the organizer, nobody can do a perfect job. But we try and strive to do a perfect job, and we need your help to actually help us do that as well. But we need you to take these experiences that you, that you see in Dubai to your country and try to do the same there as well. Thank you very much for hosting us here. And uh, yeah, let's, let's spread the word about Dubai, Dubai's ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, you are uh, also part of the MENA region. So um, maybe if you can talk about more uh, vast regional uh, peculiarities um, related to the blockchain community? Sure. So I think as, as an industry globally, we went through different cycles and there was definitely a, a hype cycle earlier on and then things went quiet for a bit and there was the whole it's blockchain, not uh, Bitcoin or crypto discussion. And then from there, we started seeing uh, institutionals companies, institutional participation, building internal tooling, f utilizing uh, this technology. Now, in the last couple of years, what we've seen is uh, an uptick in the decentralized finance. 
And in general, I think in the MENA region, we need the foundation of developers, people that understand how to actually create code and, and software. And then from there, you can start to build these uh, technologies. So at the foundational layer, we need to improve, and there are a lot of initiatives that are happening on a national level and, and on local levels of uh, different programming, software development, uh, careers that are being created, education programs, and those are the foundations that you need to actually build blockchain um, you know, products, ideas, services. Um, so I think we need to start from the basics, uh, and, and that's something that's already taking place. Awesome, thank you very much. Henry, you are based, uh, headquartered in uh, Hong Kong, right? So uh, you can be our expert for, for, for the Asian market. Sure. What is different about the, the Asian community? Uh, absolutely, as you guys know, there's a lot of crypto activity in Asia. If you look at some of the big hubs, like Hong Kong, for example, that's where BitMEX was based, that's where the perpetual swap was created. FTX was based there until they, they recently moved out. Uh, Tether was invented in Hong Kong as well, the stable coin. Block One, the biggest IC of the world, happened in Hong Kong. So they, Asia had a big advantage. And of course, China, as you guys know, what's happening, the story there. Uh, of course, there's been a lot of changes recently. Uh, I, think with, I think everyone knows what's happening with the Bitcoin mine uh, ban in China, that that has all moved out, not only to Russia, Kazakhstan, but particularly the U.S. I would not be surprised the U.S. becomes the biggest Bitcoin miner in the next couple of months. But also the big ban that happened uh, two Fridays ago, where now we're seeing human capital move out. And I actually believe cities like the Dubai and the UAE will benefit from that human capital move that is coming out. The ecosystem has been quite vibrant in many regards. Uh, I would argue the biggest problem Asia has right now is actually not crypto regulatory clarity, it's actually probably COVID uh, rules. It's very difficult to become a, a crypto hub if you physically cannot go there. For example, myself, if I fall back to Hong Kong tomorrow, I have to spend 21 days in a hotel room. If I step out of my room, it's six months in prison. Not the best outcome. However, I think there's other issues that we're looking at. I believe one of the biggest uh, things that's keeping a lot of my attention is crypto education. I think as a community, we have to do a better job in actually educating uh, the, not only the, the, the retail public, but a lot of the institutional players coming in. And second thing that I'm worried, not only in Asia, by the way, including here across the world, is a lot of the bad apples. I think many of us, many of you in the room, are here building the future of finance, really trying to push the boundaries. Unfortunately, there's still a lot of bad apples trying to take advantage of the situation. And what scares me the most right now is one or two of these bad apples can give the industry a bad name. I think that's something collectively we need to actually ensure that does not happen or else it stops the ecosystem moving forward, as it happened, by the way, many times in the past. Thank you, Henry. Jane, you've been working with emerging markets. Um, I don't know if you can generalize um, uh, to this extent, but still, if you talk about emerging uh, economies, um, how would you evaluate this uh, blockchain vibe in this country? So, so I just want to start because my first experience um, after learning about blockchain was at a hackathon in London and we actually came with the Central Bank of Papua New Guinea to the UK to get 200 developers to help us solve the problem of financial inclusion in that country that has very little infrastructure and very few people who are banked. And the community who came together for that hackathon came from 50 different countries. So people from all around the world, including India, including Africa, including the Caribbean, were all sitting there trying to solve this problem. So my first lesson was that the blockchain community is incredibly generous and generally are people who really want to see the world as a better place and will give freely of their time. And that was a really important lesson for me. And I work with uh, institutions and companies in emerging markets. One of the winners of that hackathon was from India, and I think he's here today, and we still work together, helping them because they're building solutions for problems that are real and that exist. They're not just trading crypto, although some of them are. They're actually trying to build things that make their countries a better place. So everywhere where I'm working at the moment, Kenya, Nigeria, India, Indonesia, these are the projects that we're trying to build. It's the transformational projects. And I think suddenly the, the DeFi, the NFTs, the play to earn games give us a whole new perspective on the prospects for people in emerging economies. Thank you very much. Yeah, definitely the social impact of the blockchain technology is, is, is very important. And uh, uh, we are all here to, to try to make this world better for everyone. Um, Sandeep. So regional developments, but I also would like to um, 
to ask you about the developers community in general, because this is a very, very important uh, group of people. Um, how would you evaluate the, the, how the, this world changed during the last 12 months, the developers in general? Because in my opinion, still, uh, the percentage of blockchain developers out of the software developers in general is still minuscule. Um, so, how is it developing currently? Um, uh, definitely, like, you know, uh, your observation is correct that the <clears throat> percentage of de blockchain developer compared to the larger space, uh, uh, you know, larger number of developers is less. But I think uh, in the last, like, one and a half years, when many of these apps, so previously, if you go, you know, uh, you know, be before, let's say 2020, it was mostly the infrastructure, I call it infrastructure era, like everybody, because the base infrastructure was not ready. So people are building scalability solution, people are building wallets, RPC connections and things like that. Once that was sorted and, and you know, like, in some form, we have some level of scalability available. Then came the DAP era. And, you know, an average, uh, let's say, a developer which is not into the infrastructure, research, uh, infrastructure research, for him or her, it's very difficult to, you know, uh, to get into or switch careers into blockchain because it, it requires a lot of upkeep. But, but, you know, when you bring, when you come to the DAPs, it's much easier. The entry barrier is much easier. And that's what we are seeing in the last one, one and a half years is that when these dApps have come in and then, you know, many of the dApps have, uh, you know, got billions of dollars of uh, valuations and things like that. And then a lot of entrepreneurs and, and developers sitting on the sidelines who had heard about it, they started thinking that, okay, there is a lot of value to be created here, right? So, so now I'm seeing, let's say, in Indian community, I'm seeing a lot of, uh, you know, entrepreneurial elite, uh, which I, you know, I, I would say that who have already previously done some startups, uh, who have raised money from the, you know, very reputed VCs and, uh, you know, built some apps which had uh, and exited some apps, uh, you know, where we, where they had millions of users, they uh, are, are starting to get interested in this, like, you know, students from the top-notch uh, engineering schools, students from the top-notch business schools and all that. So that is a very positive sign uh, for me, and uh, that that community is is, is growing uh, more than ever. And I also want to comment, uh, although about uh, Dubai also, like you know, I uh, like I have also start like starting uh, started to spend more of my time in Dubai because we have now uh, I mean a global organization. We have Polygon uh, Switzerland, Polygon US, and you know Polygon uh, Europe and things like that. So, you know, I have to move around, but I've been, uh, uh, you know, spending more time in Dubai. And my theory is that, you know, the way you have software as a service. So, Dubai provides you lifestyle as a service, <laughs> last. <laughs> so, you know, and I've, I've been, you know, kind of, uh, I mean, a lot of Indian entrepreneurs are now uh, moving to Dubai because of the favorable, uh, you know, uh, or ease of doing business over here and all that. And uh, I think that, you know, few small things here and there, if, if they can be sorted, uh, and, and the, the Dubai authorities are doing absolutely phenomenal job, and this can really become the, the, the crypto hub. So, you know, all kudos to, uh, you know, Dubai, uh, uh, you know, leadership and management and the, and the regulatory bodies here. So true, so true. I totally agree with you. And I would also like to highlight that, well, the decentralization in general, the centralization of uh, work, uh, of uh, communications this year has totally transformed uh, the way we, we see the world. And uh, well, I'm managing a decentralized team of over 100 people all over the world. And what makes it so special, Cointelegraph's team, is that we actually interacting every day through Zoom, uh, Jimmy, it's all the other platforms. We have this opportunity to to look at the world through the eyes of the others and this is really very important and uh, even though physically we have been um, maybe closed uh, locked down and uh, it's definitely it hasn't been a, a very uh, open experience for us but still we had this incredible opportunity uh, through the screen of our computers to look at the world through the eyes of others and this is also that makes uh, this space so exciting for me um, okay, we, we talked a lot about excitement. Uh, let's talk a little bit about challenges. 
Um, but I would also like you to think of this in an optimistic perspective, what we, um, as, as a community, as members of this ecosystem, could do to overcome these challenges. Um, who would like to start? Yeah, yeah. Sure. <laughs> so, uh, looking at challenges optimistically, I would say, uh, specifically, for example, for the crypto industry, I think a lot of regulations have come out and, and that's great. But then as a company, you work with several partners, including banks, for example. And what I would say is uh, having dealt with banks in multiple countries uh, for this industry, there's still a lot of uh, lack of will or, or um, even opportunity for companies like us to interact with the bank and get something working. So I believe regulations alone are not enough. You need to have an ecosystem of partners, which is banks, uh, financial institutions, uh, other government bodies, non-financial regulators, need to be on board in order to make something happen. So I think further collaboration is important. And then if we're talking about blockchain more broadly, I would say the tangible use cases that exist today that we can use in everyday life, we need to see more of those prototypes uh, come out. Uh, you know, for example, I read, I think it was three, four years ago, about Sony working on a, um, a blockchain application for education certificates. Till this day, when you're applying for a job or, or you're uh, working with someone, you have to send certain proof of documentation, you have to get something stamped and notarized and legalized and sent to a different place. So it's, it's, it's a little absurd that we're doing that today in a world where you can send money, send emails, do all that. Um, so I think for that specific youth case, you would need a Ministry of Education, you need universities, you need developers to all work together to make it happen. So I think good ideas work, but without collaboration from all partners of the ecosystem, it doesn't really move the needle. Thank you, yeah, I totally agree. Collaboration rather than competition, because yeah. competition also actually benefits mm -hmm. of cooperation in yeah. the end. Dr. Mawan. So uh, I think there are certain things that make our lives harder. Uh, I mean, everyone, not only regulators or, or crypto businesses. And, and one of them is complexity and the rate we move forward, actually. I'll give you an example. Like, I, I, I was explaining uh, DeFi to somebody, and then they asked me about NF NFTs, and I explained NFTs. And then a guy in the room just destroyed everything I said because he said, well, you know now that you can actually collateralize your NFTs and get a loan on NFTs. And I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> we are moving in such a, such a pace that one concept by itself in isolation is hard to explain. You have two concepts that are equivalently hard for a layman to understand. NFT is very hard for somebody to get the value proposition there for, for somebody like a digital file. Come on, how can you monetize this? By themselves, they're complex, but when you introduce DeFi <laughs> NFT loans, you lose everybody. Mm -hmm. And we, we really owe it to ourselves, not, not only to progress, but also have an equivalent system of, of teaching people, uh, you know, the, the basics, teaching people coding, teaching people how smart contracts work, creating the community. And I, think, I think institutional buyers coming in helps, uh, but again, we have to also put more efforts. Each project has to have a lot of things. One of them, for example, is an educational campaign and a foundation for pushing this kind of education to the public. For me, people like me at my age, I think it's a bit too late, but for the younger <laughs> generations in schools, you know, teenagers as they're playing Axie Infinity, everybody gets it, you know? The teenagers get it. Try to explain to their fathers <laughs> that they are actually making money from gaming. It becomes a bit complex. Yeah. Education is so important. Henry, you also mentioned education before. Uh, Very important. So, what are the current challenges to educating uh, masses and maybe some other challenge that you, you can find uh, within the space? I think the reality, when we try to change the future of finance, there are definitely going to be challenges, that's for sure. I think one of them is lack, uh, linked to education is the misconceptions on cryptocurrencies. How many times have we heard the whole the stories about bit, the environmental impact of Bitcoin mining, for example, when there are actually real, like, concrete changes being done? Second is AML. When, when I deal with banks and I tell that, you know, I always tell if, if you're a criminal and you're using Bitcoin, you're an idiot. For sure, you will get caught. 
You know, again, there's a lot of these misconceptions we have. Again, if you're anybody trying to launder money, again, the best way is still cash, the banking system, not cryptocurrencies, for example. And there's a lot of these misconceptions people have because of lack of awareness, lack of education on the topic. We talk about banking system today. You know what many people often don't know? There's really the entire crypto ecosystem. There's four or five banks that bank probably 80% of the market. Two in the U.S., one in the Bahamas, one in the Liechtenstein. If anything happens to these institutions, we have a systemic risk in the system. But the, the problem is because there's often this lack of education, lack of awareness uh, that, that is on some of the things on crypto. Education, again, uh, you know, I'm, I think many of you know, I'm a, I'm a, I've been teaching crypto since 2015. I'm a professor at university. I've been teaching, and I really believe we have this duty to actually do this. And because, you know, the last couple months, we went from 100 million to 220 million crypto users. If we want to reach that billion users, this education components becomes essential. Unfortunately, I still get a daily email uh, you know, from a lot of my followers on social media, people getting scammed. These exchanges doing the fake tax scam where they ask you to pay the taxes before. Some of them, they ask you to put a device on your phone they can access remotely and they wipe you out. And there's a lot of these old school Ponzi schemes that we're still seeing. And I really believe if these things continue, we're not able to, as a community, attack, address them, this is going to slow down the, the, the growth of the ecosystem from that perspective and help the ones who need it the most, especially in the emerging markets. So emerging markets, what are the challenges in the emerging markets? Thank you. Well, you know, I really agree with you about education, but I think it's also about changing the narrative and creating a new vision for these possibilities of the decentralized future. Because even yesterday I was on a panel talking about Bitcoin and energy consumption, like really? We're, we're here, <laughs> we should be talking about much more inspiring things than that. And we need to be telling that story to other people so they can appreciate the possibilities. So that's the first thing. The second thing is access. If, if you're thinking about emerging markets, you're thinking about illiterate people. What can we do with voice activation, for example, for illiterate people? What can we do to make sure that the mobile phone penetration, which is already quite wide, can be wider? What can we do with the telcos to give people access to mobile credit so that they can use their mobile phones, for example? So I think there's a lot of things that we can do there to kind of bridge that divide. I think also we need to be able to think about scalability and cost because, you know, some of the different platforms and the way that you have to pay to use them are never going to work for really poor people. So people need to also think about that. So these opportunities are there, but, but what I'd like to say to all of you and the people who are thinking about it is don't just think about how many coins you've got in your wallet. Think about the social transformation that is possible with blockchain if we all think about the possibilities for everyone in the world, not just for ourselves. Yeah, thank you. That is really important. Again, different perspectives um, that also can help us avoid misconceptions about the industry if we take into consideration different uh, visions and different points of view. Sandeep, what, what challenge do you see in the industry and how are you going to overcome it? Yeah, I mean, I would, uh, uh, you know, then because all the panelists touched upon very important uh, other angles, I would maybe, you know, touch upon some of the technical angles that, uh, you know, uh, one thing uh, that Jane discussed that, you know, scalability, I think, uh, I mean, we as Polygon, we stand uh, for exactly, you know, solving that problem itself. And uh, I think it's very evident in terms of the, uh, the, the usage on Polygon. We recently surpassed even Ethereum main chain in terms of the daily average users. And, uh, you know, that potentially would make Polygon POS chain, for example, uh, one of the probably the most adopted chain in terms of both the uh, applications and the end users. And uh, the reason for that is that uh, is, is the same that, you know, that the gas fees and the experience of using Polygon is, uh, is, is much more suitable for the mass users uh, compared to, let's say, Ethereum main chain, which is which which primarily you need to have a certain amount of, you know, portfolio, you know, in order to trade or in order to pay that kind of like $200 in gas fees. Uh, and most of the applications uh, on Ethereum mainnet, which are also on Polygon, uh, like, you know, biggest of the big, like OpenSea and uh, Aave and, and, you know, all these uh, bigger DeFi applications, uh, they all see larger number of daily active users uh, from uh, compared to that on their Ethereum stores. So the reason for that is, again, like the accessibility. So 
so that that adds as one layer of uh, I would again I, I call it in uh, as a part of user experience itself so that's the first part of user experience the other part of user experience is to remove the uh, the complexity on on uh, in terms of interacting with the uh, with the blockchain applications uh, which is uh, like you know I mean there are patterns evolving in terms of social uh, key recovery key management is a very big issue and then you know paying the gas fees for transactions and all that so you know people are uh, working on uh, let's say meta transactions where you end user doesn't need to pay and the app pays for the transaction fees and things like that so you know all these patterns are still in the evolving phase and I think uh, you know uh, in, in, in you know maybe six twelve months we will reach a place where you know it will be more formalized and the user experiences for the mass users uh, will be uh, will be slightly better and they will incrementally uh, improve so user experience is one challenge I see in terms of scalability uh, I mean uh, you know if you go one year back I think we could probably on all the you know public blockchains available we could support probably maybe up to 1 million daily active users uh, with, with, with all the scalability that is available now I think we are we are ready to onboard the next 10 million users uh, on blockchains but uh, you know from go for going from 10 million daily active users to 100 million daily active users there still needs to be a lot of work on the infrastructure side but that can happen parallelly while in the meanwhile the scalability that is available for us uh, for up to let's say 10 15 million users that will happen in the next two years and hopefully the infrastructure catches up by that time for even larger scalability uh, so yeah I mean scalability would be my you know second thing and uh, uh, the last part would be obviously everybody touched upon I'm, I mean the regulation and especially as a startup I'm, I'm talking uh, from the point of view of, uh, of, of founders that you know I think banking is still a very big challenge for uh, most of the founders and uh, you know being able to you know pay salaries to the uh, employees let's say if people are in, 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 in India or you know some other geography where crypto is still not allowed as payment and things like that so uh, you know some of these things uh, company setup is, is fairly sorted in some of the geographies but then you know uh, banking and some of these uh, enterprise related stuff are still some, uh, some of the challenges once they get resolved I think we are already seeing but we'll see even more uh, you know exponential pace in terms of this uh, you know Cambrian explosion that we are seeing uh, for the D apps. Well, it's definitely a very long path uh, ahead of us still uh, but honestly well I've been in the space since 2017 and what have what have what has happened since then is just incredible. Is there anyone in the in the in the room uh, who has joined the space this year 2021? Ah, enjoy, wonderful. And uh, last year, 2020, great. You guys are still early, don't worry. <laughs> well, it's already veteranism, I guess. 2020 in our space is already so much. Uh, okay, my, uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Let's maybe use this. Do we have a mic? Thank you very much. Please introduce yourself and... Um... Yeah, thank you, esteemed panelists. I am Professor Sahu and I am a professor of business in, uh, you know, SPGN School of Global Management in Dubai and a visiting professor at NITI. So, uh, firstly, I would like to thank the panelists for touching upon education and emerging markets. So, one of the challenges which I face in courses like global trade is to touch upon the blockchain areas. And my question to a fellow professor, do you think we have real world applications which are probably built on blockchains which are talking about problems in global trade and how blockchain is solving? And can I get some case studies and what would be a good source for such case studies? Because in my class of 60, probably one or two people have uh, interest in cryptocurrencies, but everybody wants to learn about blockchain. So as an educator, how do I address this challenge using some of the case studies uh, or applications which from your experience you have seen in the real world. That would be lovely I, to I know. I can answer that actually. Uh, so I'm part of the World Economic Forum uh, Future Council on Cryptocurrencies and companies such as PwC are also uh, contributing to, the, to this uh, kind of toolkit that's actually done by 
uh, the World Economic Forum. One, of the, one such toolkit uh, is for logistics more specifically, and you can actually go online and download the whole toolkit where any logistics uh, country or entity or stakeholder can actually go through all these studies that have been done for uh, um, you know, using blockchain in practically in the logistical use case, which is one of the best use cases uh, for blockchain where it involves all the you know, uh, value takes from uh, uh, blockchain, which is uh, value transfer, notarization, and record keeping, as well as smart contracts. So it's a perfect use case, uh, I think. Uh, the, the other part is uh, uh, World Economic Forum as well has, an, uh, has something called C4IR. And they do their own actual research in certain regions. In, in Dubai, we have one in MS Towers. And that did a couple of studies about not only blockchain technology and use cases in the UAE and insights from those use cases, but also tokenization and how it actually applies to real world, world problem with some examples as well. So it's a good reading uh, in that sense. Anybody else in the panel would like to add something? Sure, first of all, I just want to thank you that you're spending the time to teach your students about this topic. I find it unacceptable that certain universities let students graduate out of business schools in 2021 with no courses on crypto or blockchain when their degeneration will be the most impacted, so, which is absolutely, so thank you for your service on that perspective. Yes, thank you very much. And I would also, sorry, Henry. Uh, this was a Dr. Marwan talked about a lot of these issues on factoring and I think in trade finance and letters of credit, the whole concept is law. I would say one thing as well we don't often talk about is the whole world of stable coins and how much is now being used in actually cross-border payments. Today, the average fee of a cross-border payment is 7%. It's double digits in many emerging markets, which is absolutely a failure, I believe, with the entire financial system. And finally, we're seeing not only retail and the, the migrant workers and the likes, there's over 500 million people changing, sending $250 billion a year, and that's they're able to benefit, but also businesses. If you're a business today in Malaysia, during doing business with a, biz, uh, with a business in, uh, in, in, in the African continent, good luck, first of all, getting your bank account, and good luck getting the whole process in place, and uh, with all the hidden fees, explicit fees ex that you're going to be paying for the service. And that's one thing that you were, the data shows increasingly relying, we're seeing the rise of stable coins on that perspective. Today, there's about $130 billion in stable coins, and obviously those numbers will increase over the next couple of months, and I'm hopefully to see uh, uh, the whole international trade is benefiting from it, especially along with the retail uh, public as well. So thank you for your question from that perspective. Yeah, and I also want to add, I think your uh, you know, question was that how these, uh, some of these applications can add value to the rural areas and things like that, and, and on Polygon, and I'm very happy that uh, some of the Indian entrepreneurs also like, uh, you know, I don't see it in the, like there are a large number of US, Europe applications also, but then I see that a lot of Indian entrepreneurs are trying to solve these real world problems with blockchain. So we have like applications like Buhar, in case you need uh, case studies, I can probably connect you, uh, that they are uh, like, you know, they are doing this in Naxal affected, uh, you know, uh, areas of India where, uh, you know they are they are they have built this grievances addressal platform because many times like the local system you know fails over there and then you know people can't even uh, express their grievances over there so they have built like this sms based uh, you know application where you send an sms and it logs a complaint on blockchain where it cannot be denied so it directly and they have uh, you know uh, brought in some top level officials to whom to whose office this gets reported so there are other things also you see the government of maharashtra which has like you know, almost like uh, 160 million, uh, uh, you know, uh, I mean, population in terms, uh, and then they are uh, doing their COVID uh, uh, certificates, uh, I mean, the, the vaccination certificates on chain. And similarly, you have uh, people issuing now, uh, you know, legit doc, for example, issuing, uh, you know, uh, degrees and things like that on, on blockchain. So those are also some good uh, case studies that you can uh, take for your students. Yeah, and the nice thing about it, a lot of these projects, including COVID contact tracing projects, a lot of them are actually uh, open source. So any country, any entity, any person, even a student can look at the use case, try it out. And, uh, and then and the nice thing about it is decentralized. You can have several use cases and countries or institutions or health departments can actually have uh, a good, you know, sovereign kind of solution and as well as accept uh, other uh, countries, uh, you know, uh, certificates, for example, uh, based on blockchain. And this is good for identity, for uh, COVID tra contract tracing, vaccinations, travel, a lot of other stuff. 
And behind every use case, there are people with their personal stories, that, with their needs to, to make this world better. And in my opinion, it's, it's really great to see that the history is being created, created now. And uh, young people, especially students, have this opportunity to find their role models within the space people with passion and this is very important also as a part of education. We have another question, this will be the last one. Please introduce yourself. Uh, hi, uh, Mazen Gadir, I work in the healthcare industry. Uh, so my question quickly, in terms of the R&D, picking up on the last point that uh, uh, the last panelists mentioned, in terms of the R&D aligning, um, you know, um, some of the blockchain advancements, uh, uh, research, uh, with, the, with the UAE, leadership vision, the 50 years, the projects, the nationalization of skill set, um, uh, competencies. What are some of your thoughts on bringing also the R&D uh, into the UAE in alignment with the leadership vision? Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I'm a bit confused <laughs> with the last, but not least. Maybe Doc Mawan, it's okay. uh, uh, for so, you. So uh, with the 50 years vision for the next 50, uh, I think there, the, the prerequisites are set. I think one of them is a cashless society. Another one is digital identity. Uh, there's a lot of other ones, of course. There's, we're running out of time, so I can't mention all of them. But uh, we actually depend on coders. We depend on the digital economy, the digital transformation. In this country, it's a very clear direction from the leadership here to prioritize digital, prioritize learning. And uh, on 29th of, of October, we're actually celebrating uh, the Coders Day, so, so uh, it's a whole day uh, every year that's going to be celebrating uh, people uh, who actually program. And uh, there's a lot of initiatives. There's one in Abu Dhabi most recently announced. There's going to be many, much more announced across the whole UAE when it comes to you know, coding and uh, this digital economy. And, and so it's a clear you know, direction that we're taking, and I think all the world will be to go in that direction, and COVID proved that digital actually works, even though we had some problems you know, uh, in the beginning for people getting used to being fully digital. But I think uh, even though it was a tragedy and, a, and a, a pandemic, but the learnings from it actually taught us that there's no time and place for work. You can do everything digitally now. We got used to it. Even our kids are more adaptive than us when it came to education, right? We suffered as parents, but they didn't. They are much more adaptive to this kind of change going from physical to digital. And I think it's no, no doubt that this is going to be at least a huge part of our future, if not the future virtual. We are all looking forward. Thank you so much for this wonderful Thank insights. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you again, Dubai, for, for hosting us. Thank you.